Hey guys, we got Steve and Ed here, 6'5 guys. We're here at the range today with Greg. Good man. I'm from KN Arms. So uh, tell us a little bit about kind of what we have going today. Today we're doing a demo with uh, Ray Sanchez from Thunder Beast Arms. He brought out a bunch of silencers and uh, can uh, rifles to let people shoot and show that basically they make the best stuff on the market awesome. for as far as accuracy and repeatability. And how long have you been working with uh, Thunder Beast? Uh, about a year now. So what sort of feedback are you are you getting uh, from your uh, clientele around their product? Um, every precision shooter I've talked to loves Thunder Beast because of the fact that you can shoot their cans with the suppressor on, with the suppressor off, and it's still zeros. What do you, what do you see as far as trends, uh, you know, things that are hot right now that people, people are looking at? Um, right now, all the NFA stuff is hot. SBRs are getting pretty hot. Mm -hmm. I'm selling, you know, you can't sell an AR these days, but you can sell SBRs like nobody's business. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, t tell us a bit about that. We recently had um, some positive changes uh, here in the state of Washington around SBRs. So, so maybe you can talk a bit about that and what what uh, you see your clientele doing around that. Um, yeah, the state finally made SBRs legal to own in this state, so we can get rifles that are more fun to shoot because they're not real heavy on the end. Right. And um, they've been selling like crazy, so. So um, when you're going back on the range, we probably need to get, get back. But, um, exactly. You want to let the folks that are watching the video know um, the website, how, how to find you, how to contact you? Uh, k and &E Arms, 206-930-8289. We're in Kent, Washington. And like you, we said, I'm just a small-time home dealer. And come visit us. We'll see you back out on the road. I mean, it's easy for me to sit here and tell you how repeatable we are. I'm here to show you how repeatable we are. What do you think of that 223 can? Hi, I'm Ed. I'm Steve. And we're the 6-5 guys. Today we're going to bring you the first in a series of interviews of people in the shooting community that have achieved uh, a certain level of recognition by following uh, their passions and their dreams. We're here today with Ray Sanchez at Cascade Rifle and Pistol Club in Ravenstill, Washington. Uh, we just wrapped up uh, a little bit of a range and, and demo session with some folks and had a lot of fun. Yeah, a lot of fun, guys. So, so, so Ray, I mean, you, you got a really interesting story about how Thunder Beast started. So, just you know, take us back a bit. You know, how did you get into shooting, and and you know, how how did you get to, to where you are now to be what, you know, you're one of the premier names in the industry. I mean, a lot of people know you. So, so tell our viewers a bit about that. Um, well, I've always been pretty competitive, and you know, a little bit of ADD when I get into something and, and kind of do it. Um, I've been shooting quite a bit, shooting pistols and carbines. Uh, I lived in Southern California for a while, a lot of pistol rounds, a lot of carbine rounds downrange. I came back to Colorado, um, just a little drive east from my house. You drive 20 minutes east and it's, uh, you can see the curvature of the earth pretty much, you know? I mean, so the natural progression was how far away can I get, how far away can I get? Um, started stretching things out, started doing searches online and, you know, found web pages like Sniper's Hide and I, I ran across a guy, Zach Smith, I'm sure you guys are familiar yeah, yeah, with, yeah, and right. Zach's one of my partners over at Thunder Beast. Yeah. And it turned out, you know, he lives a mile down the street from me. So, you know, we contacted each other, we started shooting together. Um, and we just kind of fed off each other. I mean, me and Zach would go out and put steel out and try shooting 308 at first, you know, we didn't know right. there was any problem in 308, like right. most people at first. Mm -hmm. But Zach's a smart guy, he's an engineer, and you know, we started looking at other bullets and 6.5s and 7s and started having guns built and as we started backing up we started realizing you know what what's affecting our bullet and we started talking about density altitude and we started printing all our data cards out by density altitude because yeah. where we are 
Um, we sit at about 5,000, 6,000 feet, depending on where you are in town, actual elevation. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you wake up in the morning, it could be 30 degrees, but by 3 o'clock, you could have a 50 degree Shift. temperature swing. Yeah. And, you know, we're noticing that in the beginning, it wasn't making a whole lot of sense to me, but why is my zero still zero? Why, you know, I had this good and now this isn't good. And we just got forced into paying attention to these things. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun, you know, Zach's so smart, he wrote his own ballistics program to start taking all this stuff into account. And that's kind of how we just started stretching out and backing up and stretching out and backing up and very fortunate to live in a place that, you know, 25, 30 minutes from my house, we could shoot out as far as we can see. Yeah. And, and so we met up with Zach and I know a lot of people know Zach through his blog, uh, Demigod uh, mm -hmm. LLC. Yep. So a lot of you guys can search on that and you'll find all, all sorts of stuff. And so I, I understand that the prototype suppressors he was using back in 2008 were the ones that, that you all had, to, had worked on. Is that, that correct? Yeah, we, um, well, there was another element. Um, I got an email one day, uh, a PM on sniper side from a gentleman who just moved to Cheyenne mm -hmm. saying he saw some of our posts of, you know, stretching things out and trying to shoot stuff far away. And um, his name is Shane Coppinger, and Shane's the third partner in Thunder Beast. He's the, the production end of things. Mm -hmm. So Shane was a machinist in the military, and uh, he got posted out there in Cheyenne, and we started shooting, and all of us own suppressors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're not knocking on anybody, but none of them were really good for what we were doing. Mm -hmm. None of them were really good for the precision game. One would be quiet but not repeatable. Mm -hmm. One would be pretty repeatable but loud. Mm -hmm. One would be okay but then as it got hot stuff would start to move right so you know i had three or four or five cans i had several cans shane had some cans um we just you know sitting around talking and shooting and we just thought we could build a better mousetrap if we really concentrated on on precision rifles and doing cans for precision rifles right so yeah sitting down with shane and zach we, we came up with some ideas and you know we got our ffl sot and started making chips and that's probably about seven eight years ago now now you guys, you guys are uh, evolving the product line. We've seen some really interesting stuff, uh, some of the new things in your lineup. Um, curious to know, uh, some of the things that you're really excited about most as far as your products that are coming out, things that you have um, in the pipeline. I like the new CB brake a lot. You know, we kind of got pushed into that from the customers. Customers asking for a smaller 30 caliber brake. Mm -hmm. The original 30 caliber brake it was the size it was because it had to work with the 338 mm -hmm. PSR stuff. Um, you know, we do quite a bit of stuff with Barrett firearms, and they, they run on 338 VA. And that quick change barrel system, we needed a, a smaller break for the 30 cal, the 300 and 308s. So it was easier. It was easy to just shorten that break chamber mm -hmm. and still have the the cans mount. And it worked. It's an effective system, but. Um, we just kept hearing people call it like the pig nose. They thought it was short and fat, and mm -hmm. they wanted something a little sleeker. Right. And uh, you know, we kind of agreed with them, but our you know function dictates form to a certain point. Right. So when we we decided we were going to do smaller breaks, they it had to be you know more efficient. It had to meet their you know the the market's design request. And you couldn't sacrifice the, the, the technical excellence of repeatability and you know, no we yeah. weren't willing to do that at all so we still have a nice conical shoulder in the back mm -hmm. that the can butts up again so it's it's 100 percent repeatable it's 100 percent accurate you know it's as good as as the direct mm -hmm. thread stuff is mm -hmm. um the brake is you know 30 to 40 percent more efficient than the original 30 caliber brake was um it looks good mm -hmm. For the AR market, I'm excited for us, you know, moving into the AR market down the world. We, mm -hmm. We've made quite a name for ourselves in the precision world. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we did go ahead and design a for the ARs. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't want brakes on AR-15s. You mm -hmm. know, you get that noise, that concussion. So we did do a thread over muzzle brake flash hider. It's a three prong. As I demonstrated, there's no ring yeah. when yeah. you hit it, which is pretty nice. That, that's impressive because a, a, a lot of folks out there that have shot, you know, prong flash hiders, it sounds like a tuning fork, you know, you, you, yeah. at the end of your rifle. So, and yeah, I saw him just hitting it, and I mean, you could not get that thing yeah, to right. ring or right. break. Or we tasked the engineer. We told him. He said, you know, there's a couple ones out there that it's just a little annoying to me when I'm shooting the suppressed rifle and I get this ting inside the can. Mm -hmm. It's not the end of the world, but I didn't like it. Right. Um, we tasked them with, okay, we're going to do this flash hider. It has to be a very, very, very good flash hider. Three prong, no ring. Mm -hmm. And uh, man, he pulled it off. I, I, 
kudos to Curtis on that one. You did a very Excellent. good job. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, and, and you know, just for the folks out there, I mean, I, I bought a 30P1 about uh, two years ago. And you're absolutely right. I mean, it's repeatable. I mean, when, when Steve and I are, are out practicing, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do a cold bore and, and literally, you know, five or six or 10, whatever. I mean, just they just land right on top. I mean, there's no thinking, gee, you know what, how much is my can going to shift? So I, I just have to tell you as a customer, you, you, you definitely achieved. Well, thanks. And that's yeah. our goal is, you yeah. know, as long range shooters, um, it's nice to take as much variable out of the equation as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing worse than missing something down range and not being sure why you missed. So I've got a question. Um, perhaps something that some of our, our viewers may be interested in. Um, knowing that you guys do a lot of instruction mm -hmm. and having kind of come through the discovery process and, and coming up within the precision shooting community, I wanted to know if you had any thoughts or recommendations in terms of guys that are actually trying to improve their skill level, they're trying to get more first round impacts on target, mm -hmm. what, are the, what are things that you would have them work on? What are the things that they should be paying attention to? Um, you know, one of the things I do is that first shot of the day is real important to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really try to take my time and, and pay attention to whatever's going to give me, help give me a win call. Mm -hmm. You know, like out where we live, it's easy to stretch out 800, 900, 1,000 mm -hmm. yards. I, I try making that first shot of the day a challenging shot even if I'm laying down prone I mean I know in matches we're not always laying down nice and flat and prone sometimes it's a little more challenging than that but um I, I really try to make that first shot of the day a tough shot um you know you have to look at whatever is available around here you guys have all these big trees that really kind of help mm -hmm. quite a bit out east of where we are um and where we shoot in New Mexico a lot the shrub brush is only about this big and it's tough sometimes it doesn't even move unless there's a 20 25 mile an hour wind yeah. so you know looking at mirage at midpoints and i really try to make that first shot of the day mm -hmm. mean something where i really take my time try to make a wind call and when you're talking about a challenging uh first shot of the day you're talking about eight nine hundred thousand yards i mean you're, you're yeah or a smaller target at closer range you know Lots of times, you know, online you'll see these guys, my gun shoots quarter minute all day. Right. It's like, well, lots of times at matches we're shooting a two minute target. So if you have a quarter minute gun and you're talking about these quarter minute groups all day, you should be yeah. able to show up at a match and hit two minute targets all day. Right. And, you know, as you guys know, it's it's <laughs> yeah. not always that easy. That's right. It's challenging. So, yeah, it could be um, like Friday we were out here over in Yakima shooting with uh, Kalen and those guys. And we had a, a six inch plate at 690. So that's a sub minute target. Mm -hmm. That's a tough target with yeah. any whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So you really have to be on the wind call. You have to pay attention. You know, what's going on where you are? What's going on where the target is? What's going on in the middle there? Mm -hmm. And, you know, make an educated call. And, you know, when you send that round, it's having good form and be able to see your impacts, right? Nothing's right. more important than the last shot fired. Right. But that first shot of the day, there's nothing more rewarding than laying down, sending it, and seeing it, and then hearing that ring. Yeah. Right. That, to me is the best and then a lot after that first shot a lot of the days not spent prone mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. it, it's it's shooting off of sticks mm -hmm. it's we were practicing offhand a bit the other day you know mm -hmm. especially with our rifles you know yeah. we're shooting 24 inch to 26 inch barrel rifles with suppressors on the end and big scopes of what 15 16 17 pound rifles are pretty common and standing there holding those offhand is is challenging. Absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah, we, we know so, that. Yeah, you learn how to tie in with your sling and, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and using shooting sticks, uh, not always uh, uh, the, the hog saddles and the tripods, you know, right. but just regular stony point shooting sticks and, and getting into position quick with those. It's not just taking the time to use them, but it's using them efficiently in a match. You know, when you're under the buzzer, you guys know what happened. Shoot a ready right. beep, and it's mm -hmm. like, oh, what's going on? That's and right. Yep. The mistakes compound themselves. Mm -hmm. And 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 you know, as you you know, learn things, try different te techniques, different uh, equipment. Did did you kind of see a, a nice steady progression of your capabilities, or was it you know more of a sawtooth where you just you know you just saw yourself bump? You know, there were just some things you did that was like, wow, you know, that this this really really helped me. Or is it more gradual? I, I think for me, it was a little like little spikes here and there. Um, because you, you, you get the, the time allotment sometimes where maybe for three or four weeks in a row things work out and you can send quite a few rounds mm -hmm. yeah. and you'll start seeing for some progression and then you know life and family in a couple of weeks you're, you're, you're not on the trigger 
Yeah. And shooting, especially long range shooting, is a perishable skill. Right. I mean, we might have the knowledge and you can still make wind calls, but little bits of movement on the gun, you know, wind. So for me personally, it's, it's, it's consistently, it's getting out and sending rounds mm -hmm. consistently. That, that really helps me. It's not like going out and shooting 100 rounds all the time. Sometimes I'll go out, I'll send 25 rounds. Mm -hmm. yep. But, you know, good rounds, quality. Yeah, that makes you know, a lot of sense. Getting in on the gun right, getting to the stick position, and, you know, setting the sticks up repeatedly. Yep. Not just, once you have them set up, they're set up. But in a match, they're usually not set. They're however we're carrying them. So it's, it's figuring out where you want them for different kneeling and standing and maybe spray painting marks on the legs. Okay. So it okay, I know the orange is kneeling, I know red is, or you know, yeah. first mark is kneeling, second mark is standing, stuff like that, and figuring that stuff out and trying to be really well thought out so that when you're under the clock, every movement mm -hmm. is for something, no waste yeah. of time in movements. Right. And, and where, where does, say, rim fire practice, dry fire practice, air rifle practice, does that factor into your, to your regimen? Um, I love shooting suppressed 22 bolt action rifles. Um, I think those CZ rifles are pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. um, some of those Savages in 17 and stuff are pretty awesome. Um, inexpensive, good trigger time. Nothing like setting up those little resetting targets. You know, they're about inch, inch and a half. Mm -hmm. Those little flippers. Right. You, know, you set that up at 100 yards and you shoot at those off hand. You have to do everything right. Yeah. When, especially with the subsonics. And, you know, you're making a wind call. Right. You're feeling the wind push you around. You have to get in the gun the same. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you get good enough to hit them, you have to do it consistently backing up several yeah. steps. Mm -hmm. Backing up several steps. So when you're shooting those things at 200 yards, that's that's shooting. That's that's good Absolutely. shooting. Those are small Especially targets. With subsonic 22 or 200. <laughs> you're holding over a mill. You know, yeah. you're holding a mill high. And you're making these wind calls, and right. the wind really affects those 22s quite a bit. On the topic of, of equipment, as you're thinking about um, getting ready for a match, you know, let's say you're going to shoot Steel Safari, something like that, what kind of rifle equipment that do you, would do you use? What caliber do you shoot? What, just curious. A I'm about. a big 260 fan. Okay. Um, and I think one of the big reasons I like the 260 is I've I've seen quite a few instances with 243s where. Sometimes the ROs have to be really good. Yeah. If someone's shooting a 243 and they hit a big heavy plate at That's 850 right. yards, yeah. if they center punch that, you know, it's not so moving. It's the not, plate yeah. barely moves yeah. and all you see is the splatter in front of the plate. Right. So an unexperienced RO mm -hmm. could be right. miss. And I've had ROs call misses on me where I've clearly hit the plate and thankfully right. I'm shooting suppressed and I can yeah. say, listen, and then you hear ting and they're like, yeah. oh, like, yeah, that's so right. I like yeah. the 243. It's got a little more oomph behind it mm -hmm. to swing those plates. Uh, I mean the 260. I mm -hmm. shoot the 139s. 139 seniors. Um, yeah, and yeah. I like the 139 seniors. They're kind of forgiving as far as seating depths and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Because I'm definitely not as anal when it comes to re reloading practices as yeah. as a lot of people. <laughs> and, and I think you're low. I laugh because. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm not either, and Ed's very uh, sensitive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm OCD when it comes to certain things, and so actually my uh, 260 load I, I picked up from uh, the back site. You know, the 40.7 grains of H4350 mm -hmm. is just a just a hammer. I mean, really. I mean, not the fastest yeah, load. I deviate man, a little. I, yeah. I I like speed. Mm -hmm. um, I'm willing to only get two two maybe 2200 good shots out of a 260 barrel. Okay. So, so I use RL17. Okay. And it's hot. You know, yeah. I'm typically pushing those 139s. Like that gun we were shooting today, I believe is right up around 29, 25, 29, 50. Oh wow. I mean, it's a point of comparison, guys. I was I was pushing out those uh, those 139s. At I'm of the belief they need to be above 2,900. All right, so that's... Yeah, that's, that's really something. I mean, you know, yeah. shooting... I'm typically shooting a, uh, a 30P1, or now I'm, I'm using the new CB9s a lot, the 30 CB9, and uh, there is no recoil impulse really to, to deal with. It's, right. it's so pleasant shooting, and just having that speed, and, you know, it comes down to the wind calls. Right. Can, can you tell us a little bit about your, um, your rifle and scope? Uh, I've been shooting the Bighorn actions. Okay. Uh, Bighorn out of uh, Brighton in Colorado. AJ's uh, you know, really good shooter. Knows a lot about cutting metal. Um, that Bighorn action is super smooth. I like that floating bolt head design. I like the fact that um, one of my 260s is on an earlier mm -hmm. uh, Bighorn. And I figured I'd want a 7. So I simply yeah. push out the pin, pull out the bolt head, put in a 7 wisdom bolt head. 
screw on a seven yeah. wisdom barrel in. Nice. Now it's a yeah. seven wisdom. Yeah, and that's and, very nice. And, and for the viewers out there, I mean, when you talk about the floating bolt head, that's similar to what Savage has, and right. I guess is attributed to much of the much the, of their, their accuracy. accuracy. Yeah. Okay. You know, when you there's a lot of good guns out there. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of good actions. Um, people who know a lot more about this stuff than I do, mm -hmm. they all say one of the weaknesses of the 700 style action is those two lugs right. mm -hmm. and the way they're locking up and it's always tilting the bolt one right. way or another. Right. Uh, I, granted, we still see a lot of accurate 700 mm -hmm. actions out there. I, there are a lot of them. Yeah, people shoot a lot for of a reason. Them, yeah. Yeah, yeah, people. Um, but I mean, to my brain, it makes sense when you have those two extra lugs, you know, so now yeah. you're at 12, 6, 9, mm -hmm. and 3, right. kind of holding that square. Yeah. It just seems to make a little more sense to me that it would be square and it is a nice little gas check mm -hmm. if something happens and you separate a case head because right. said I've been known to load a little hot and mm -hmm. push things sometimes and it pierce a primer here or there so um, I think it offers a little bit extra protection it, it's definitely nice for being able to switch something out and change calibers Absolutely. you know it's nice not being married to something be able to yeah. take a 260 and turn it into a seven wisdom. and if I shoot out that 7 wisdom barrel I simply take the 260 bolt head Put it back on and put a 260 barrel back on and on back at 260. Yeah. That mm -hmm. that's pretty nice. And as far as stocks, I mean, uh, what what where where are you uh, gravitating right now as far as stock style? I'm um, I'm pretty married to the A5 stocks. Mm -hmm. um, I am shooting a AIX Accuracy mm -hmm. International stock right now on on a Bighorn action. I was going to try to make that my uh, my match rifle this year. Mm -hmm. um, the stock's phenomenally accurate. Mm -hmm. I've got. I don't know how many, you know, tens and tens of thousands of rounds on the A5 style or the, the Mountain's T4 type stocks. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm fighting the stock a little bit, but mm -hmm. I know the chassis system is very accurate. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're both shooting chassis systems now. Yeah, I've got an AIAX, AI AX, <clears throat> but we're going to be moving to the, the Manor C2A, Tactical the carbon, carbon fiber. Yeah, we, we've just noticed some ergonomic things just with thumb position and stuff like that for the, you know, we're, we like to float our thumbs, you know. I float my, I typically yeah. on an A5, or um, I have a couple of TRG 42s. Mm -hmm. They're all very similar in, yeah. in stock design. And, and you know, mm -hmm. I have a couple of Manor T4s. They're all very similar. And my thumb usually sits on top of the tang yeah, exactly. of the action. Yeah. And not being able to do that on the AIX is just, yeah. it's, again, there's nothing wrong with the stock. The stock oh, no, is not, not fine. At all. Yeah. It's yeah. just me driving the stock that's yeah, the issue right. right now. And it's a little hard for me. And I noticed your equipment out here, you, you had, um, you know, both the, the uh, Harris uh, bipods and then uh, you also had the Atlas uh, bipods. Uh, any any thoughts about uh, either platform? I, for my match rifle, I'm going to keep running the Harris's with those Tactical Supply feet on the end. Right, right. Those aluminum feet from Tactical Supply are really nice. I, I, I like those yeah. a lot. Yeah, we'll show you. We'll show you. A, a, actually, if you look right now, you'll see a picture of those feet. Yeah, those, those look really nice, nice and aggressive. I like those. And they're super lightweight out of aluminum. Um, I find the Harris, I, I shoot the Harris with, you know, cant, tilt, mm -hmm. and uh, the slotted feet. Yeah. I find it a lot easier to adjust with one hand, mm -hmm. typically, than the Atlas for myself. Yeah. I don't yeah. like reaching up. And for me, I, I find myself having to square my Atlases up. Yeah. yeah. Quite frequently, if I if I get into a longer shot string on something, yeah. Every you know third fourth shot, I seem to have to reach up and make oh, it square the leg, again. The legs kind of they yeah, want them walk pivot. side yeah, to side. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. Whereas the Harris, you know, it can't do that. That's right. Exactly. So, um, I think the feel of the Atlas. I think you could preload the Atlas better. Yes. It feels great, yeah. but. On my match rifles and most of my rifles, I, I run the Harris. Okay. Are you using a pod lock on your Harris? I do not. I like okay. the cant because, you know, we live in the mountains. Right. And we're shooting field-type matches. Mm -hmm. So you just have to get used to the fact and comfortable with how you get on your gun and realize it's okay if your crosshairs are not squared on a target because mm -hmm. the target's probably not level. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, when we have a slope like this and there's a target sticking mm -hmm. up on the slope. Right. There's no guarantee that when I put my crosshairs on there, they're going to be like this, yeah. Yeah. at least looking like that. Yeah. I have to be confident that I'm getting on my rifle and holding my mm -hmm. rifle square, and right. it's okay if they look. So you use a off bubble, the you use a, a, a level. I used to use a bubble, but the last couple of years, I'm confident enough that I get into my right. rifle good enough that I've I've taken them off the rifles. Now I noticed you had uh, a number of USO scopes were kind of predominant mm -hmm. on your rifles. Yeah. Um, is that your preference? Yeah, I prefer USO. Um, I'm a little different than most. I mean, a lot of people run in minute of angle reticles, and USO was kind enough, you know, way back when they made a reticle for us called the Colorado Multi Gun. Mm -hmm. 
the mm -hmm. CMG reticle okay. of Mike Fields and Mike Kolar and Zach and Chalk and everybody from Colorado. We they kind of got together and passed that drawing around. It was simple. It's every minute marked, no numbers or anything on it, so it was very uncluttered. Um, it's simply one, two, three, four, and five is a little taller, and then mm -hmm. six, seven, eight, nine, and ten is a little taller. Um, simple. I run a half minute elevation knob. Mm -hmm. Most people typically run quarter minute. Yeah. Um, I run half, and mm -hmm. it's never been a problem. I like a quarter minute knob so I can get a very anal zero. Right. And then I cover my windage knob and once zeroed, I never touch my windage knob. And I like the 45 minutes and one turn of the dial. Mm -hmm. yep. And you know, we run four major matches a year mm -hmm. um, with Thunder Beast and Competition Dynamics. And especially the last couple of years, I've been ROing and mm -hmm. seeing a lot of good shooters come through. And I see a lot of the same mistakes where even good shooters sometimes will forget to zero out at the end of a stage and a rotation off. So if they're shooting a loophole or a night force, they could be 15 minutes mm -hmm. off. Right. If they finish shooting out of the or far away or something, and man, I see that mistake a lot. And the USO obviously very very responsive. I mean, they'll build a scope to pretty much any specification you want. Yeah. Right? You know, USO um, half minute elevation, Eric knobs, quarter minute windage, covered, reticles of choice. Um, I run the 3.2 to 17s mm -hmm. with the 44 millimeter objectives. I like to try to keep the scope. Yeah. I don't see a huge difference between, you know, running a 42 and like 56 or 58. Okay. I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the glass quality these days is good enough mm -hmm. that we we see, you know, we're getting the light transmission we need and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, awesome. Uh, thank you for coming out. We really yeah, appreciate really you being here today. We uh, just had an awesome time. Thanks. Yeah, no, yeah, we, we, we really had a good time. And, and again, you know, for the for the viewers out there, if you have any questions, you know, please, please reach out to us again. Yeah, give but, us a call too. Yeah, absolutely. Call uh, these guys. We're available. If you're, if you're looking for a suppressor, these are the guys. And I have to say, whenever I've, I've sent you guys an email, it amazes me that the response time. I mean, literally within hours, I mean, I, I get stuff coming back to me. Even, even for the whole purchasing experience, when I ask, hey, here's what I want to do. I, I got an email like 15 minutes later. I mean, it was just. It was well, just we appreciate incredible. it. We came. Yeah. You know, we started this company to make suppressors for us. You know, now I think there's 20 of us running around full time. And, That's great. You know, we appreciate every suppressor sale, and our goal is just to make the best, most accurate suppressors we can out there. And a big part of that's customer service. You know, you call us. We're here to help you. That that's terrific. Well, folks, until next time, remember, life's an adventure. Stay on target.